Mm -hmm. I wrote this big book because Thurgood Marshall is so important. There needed to be uh, an accurate telling of his story, particularly the story not just of what he did, but what kind of person he was. So you could say this book is not so much a, a book about what Thurgood Marshall did, but more a book of what he was like the, and the forces that shaped him. So the uh, last lynching that occurred in Maryland in 1933 was one week after Thurgood Marshall became a lawyer and he became very much involved uh, in the, in the anti-lynching movement locally and, uh, and nationally. And it's not clear to me, had that not occurred, whether he would have reconnected with his law school dean, Charles Hamilton Houston, who then became his sort of continued mentor, not just as a law school dean, but through the early years of his law practice. I'm trying in this book to show what Thurgood Marshall was like and the uh, influences that shaped him. The environment, which was the state of Maryland, the state of Maryland during the first third of the 20th century, people uh, who, and, it, and events. And in the category of people, there are really three major categories of persons that uh, I develop uh, in this book. And the largest category would be his family. In addition to his family, there were other very important uh, mentors. And thirdly, uh, there were uh, role models, uh, particularly uh, lawyers who had been great civil rights lawyers uh, in Maryland, uh, some of which, some of whom he knew and others he knew about. And uh, what this book attempts to do is to uh, identify the forces, the environmental forces, the events, and the people that shaped Thurgood Marshall. If one looks at his uh, academic career in, in college, uh, he studied courses in public speaking, in logic, in, in rhetoric, in Greek, in, in Latin, uh, in Milton, in Shakespeare. Uh, this was a man who really was determined to control and be able to use the language and to be verbally persuasive. Before he got to law school, he had, if, since the age of 13, engaged in competitive debating. And so it is later, no earlier than his last year of law school, where there's any ind indication of a special interest in civil rights. He was initially an advocate, and we watch him in his few years of law practice here in Baltimore discover that he's not only an advocate, but that he's a civil rights advocate. Thurgood Marshall participated in a debate at uh, Harvard in 1928. And uh, his side had to argue against interracial relations uh, uh, mixing because that was the side that was assigned uh, uh, to his team. It is interesting that Thurgood Marshall, as far as I can determine, never or hardly ever spoke about that experience in later years. And I think in large measure because he was required as a part of that debate to express views that he really fundamentally disagreed with. I mean, Thurgood Marshall participated in 1927 in the first debate between a historically black college and a uh, historically white college in the United States. Uh, so he was, before he got to law school, an uh, experienced debater who had debated uh, before uh, audiences of thousands uh, since the age of 13. Well, what we have in common is that we're Baltimore lawyers, African-American lawyers. Uh, what that meant is that we were rarities. I mean, the, when Thurgood Marshall was admitted, he was about the 60th African-American lawyer in the history of the state, and I'm about the 130th, so that's still a very small number. Uh, for uh, up until the 70s, we averaged two new black lawyers in the state of Maryland per year. There were three in the year that I was admitted, but none the year before and only one the year after. So what we had in common is that uh, we were what was rare in Maryland, which was a black uh, uh, a lawyer. When I went to high school, um, I got on the streetcar in front of a drugstore in which that had a lunch counter and owned by a classmate of mine at City College where I could not eat in the lunch counter. I took the number eight streetcar, got off in front of the Boulevard Theater at the 33rd 
and uh, uh, Greenmount Avenue, and of course, blacks could not go in the, uh, the Boulevard Theater. Throughout my high school years, my principal employment was setting pins in bowling alleys. I never set pins in a bowling alley in which I could bowl. So Baltimore was a, in many respects, a racially segregated uh, city. When I was a student at Howard University. I participated in sit-ins. Um, uh, one sit-in was just a few blocks uh, from, uh, uh, from this house. So on Greenmount Avenue, a place that was called the Oriole Cafeteria, just above Coles Spring Lane. Um, what was memorable about that one is that to our surprise, they let us eat. We, we ran in, grabbed this food, uh, because it was a cafeteria and the line was to the, to the right. We came in and just grabbed things because being expected to be thrown out as we had with, with other restaurants earlier in the day. And uh, we got to the cashier and they, they, they started, they added it up. I had to borrow money. And I, I had not no expectation to eat. I had a meal that I'd never seen before. I'd never eaten that I can recall baked fish. I had a plate of baked fish and you know that salad that has carrots and um, uh, raisins in it? I'd never seen that salad. That's what I had. I still to this day call it my sit-in salad. Mm -hmm. and, and so we sat there expecting any minute to be, be thrown out. But the restaurant had decided that for that day, while those demonstrations were going to take place, they were just going to serve the, uh, whoever came in and then resegregate the next day. I'm not sure when I decided, except that I know it was when I was in college. Sometime around my sophomore or junior year, I decided I was, wanted to go to law school. Uh, I had not known any lawyers before going to college, so, and I never thought about being a lawyer, but somewhere in the process of my law, uh, undergraduate years, um, I saw uh, what lawyers could do. I was the chairman of something called the DC Students for Civil Rights and um, the central role of lawyers uh, uh, became clear to me at some point and I decided I wanted to be a lawyer. Um, from the decision to write this book till today has been 10 years. Now my interest in Thurgood Marshall really started much earlier in 1975 when I went to his house late one night to have him sign a an order. Uh, that was a, a memorable occasion because after dealing with the legal matter, I sat there for two hours, about two hours and 15 minutes, as he talked about his Baltimore years. And it was simply fascinating. It's a night that I've, I've always uh, I remembered. Grew up in Baltimore, all over Baltimore. It, I did not realize how often we moved until I went into the Carter administration. I was Associate Deputy Attorney General. That required a top secret clearance, and a part of that was listing every place I ever lived. And it's when I first realized that we moved roughly every 18 months. Uh, I've lived in Northeast Baltimore, in West Baltimore, in Northwest Baltimore. We were renters, and in fact, my number one economic objective when I became a lawyer was to buy my family a home. We had never owned a home. So I brought my, bought my parents a home, the largest house that I could find in their neighborhood. They were living up near the Pimlico racetrack. I walked around there and found the biggest house that was for sale because they didn't want to change neighborhoods again and purchased that house. And so, uh, and that's where they lived until my, until my father died.